Welcome to Charity Village Connects. I'm Mary Barrell. According to the 2022 Canadian Survey on Disability, the employment rate for persons with disabilities currently sits at 62%. While this figure has risen in recent years, up from 59% in the 2017 survey, it's clear that a lot more progress should be made in creating more inclusive and accessible workplaces for Canadians with disabilities. We're talking to accessibility experts from across the sector to find out about the challenges and the barriers that contribute to this employment gap, along with what nonprofit organizations can do to address these barriers within workplaces, programming, and communities. Joining me to discuss these important issues is Ingrid Mushta. Ingrid is a licensed professional engineer with more than 25 years of work experience in corporate, entrepreneurial, and not-for-profit settings. Ingrid's work with Ontario Disability Employment Network, or ODIN, has contributed to 250 people who have a disability gaining employment. She's delivered ODIN's disability awareness and confidence training to more than 500 participants. Ingrid works with a team of professionals identifying and promoting innovative and promising practices in the business and employment service provider sectors. Um, welcome to the podcast, Ingrid. Thank you very much for having us, Mayor. I wonder if you could uh, take a moment to introduce Odin's work to our audience. Absolutely. The Ontario Disability Employment Network, as you know, the better known as ODIN, is a professional body of or a professional network of employment service providers, all united to increase employment opportunities for people who have a disability. Currently, we sit at about 120 members, in, you know, and on average, we can have anywhere from 120 to 140, depending on the year and the number of people that come and renew their memberships. But I would say about 130 is a good number. Um, they come from all corners of the province, and many of them have a national footprint. Think about the Canadian uh, Hearing Society, uh, Canadian National Institute for the Blind, March of Dimes. Uh, the work that we do can be categorized in five pillars of engagement. We build capacity for businesses to hire more inclusively by providing a number of initiatives that can include training, awareness campaigns like the National Disability Employment Awareness Month campaign that's coming up in October. And maybe we can touch base in, into that one particular aspect uh, as we go through this conversation. We build capacity in the employment service sector by also providing opportunities for professional development within the sector uh, and connecting those employment service providers to that demand um, pipeline, which is the businesses in their communities. We are always constantly looking for best practices, innovative programs, like you mentioned, and that's the third pillar of engagement, innovation and promising practices. We don't lobby the government, but we are often asked to be at tables where policy is being debated. And so that's some of the work that we do with federal, provincial, uh, and local governments to help them understand the impact of the policies that they're developing. And then the last pillar of, of engagement is around stakeholders who have an ultimate uh, impact in employment opportunities for people and those can be post-secondary educational institutions, family networks, anyone really who at the end of the day has an impact on employment for a person who has a disability. Well, that's a great overview and you're doing some incredible work. Um, we know that reports consistently indicate that Canadians with disabilities of many kinds are underemployed or unemployed at rates higher than the average citizen. Can you talk about the types of barriers that people with disabilities face in Canada when it comes to engaging in the workforce? You know, time and time again, we most people when most people think of a disability, the image of a ramp is often what comes to mind you know, that accessibility through a ramp. But the reality is that a large number of disabilities are invisible. And what's keeping a lot of those people out of the workforce are myths and misconception of what the talent that we can find in the disability community is like. You mentioned the 69% versus the 78%. You know, for people who have developmental and intellectual disabilities or who are on the autism spectrum disorder, their employment rates is even lower. You know, Inclusive Canada noted that one in four and adults who have a developmental disability are employed. That is a, a extraordinarily low number for employment rates in that population. And it is not that those, those people are 
not capable of doing work. They're very, very capable of doing systematic, consistent, uh, predictable work and work that is often quite needed. Um, I don't know if the audience here are aware of a, a, project, uh, a program called Project Search. Project Search is a program for a school to work transition that was developed out of the United States um, by the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. It is a global program now with a 78%, I think was the last data, of retention rates for those students who are leaving the educational system, who have an opportunity to do an internship in a business and learn a very uh, employed uh, empl very fine employability skills while they're doing that mentorship and they're working in hospitals, um, city halls, like doing very systematic, well-paid jobs. So when we talk about barriers, myths, misconceptions, a lack of understanding of the talent that can be found in the disability community is what consistently is keeping this population out of, out of the workforce. Another piece of data, you know, half of those people who identified as having a disability have a post-secondary educational degree, whether it is through university, college, an apprenticeship, and they are still not doing better than if they had just given up, come out of high school and started to look for a job. They are still finding the same barriers as someone who never went into a post-secondary educational institution. And what about um, those people that have not necessarily invisible disabilities, but um, uh, other kinds of disabilities, physical disabilities? Um, what are you seeing there? It's interesting that you make that point because in the survey that you mentioned, the, the 2022 Canadian Survey on Disability, the highest rate of increase is in mobility disabilities. You know, Odin just completed a project with the Hidden Mobility Alliance. Um, this is a project, a, a Canadian project funded through the Accessibilities, um, the Canadian Accessibility Act to better understand the the issues that people with physical disabilities are having lack of communication of what the environment is is what keeps some people who have a mobility disability out of the workplace not understanding the environment not understanding or not having awareness of what they will find once they are in within that environment um, People with physical disabilities are also having are finding barriers to employment. Um, Odin is currently running a project called Beyond DA or DA Compliance. So this is a project that looks at the current status or the current state of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act and the requirements that businesses have to comply by. And what we, through this project, what we're saying is that by hiring people who have a disability, you are now engaging that talent. You're gaining that perspective and that knowledge. And by having people within your organization, you can now design products and services with disability in mind. And that will push you, propel you beyond AODA compliance. And you will be serving your consumers in your community who have a disability better because you will be designing services and products with disability in mind. So any type of disability, we're finding the same in terms of what is keeping people out of the workplace, regardless of what disability we're talking about. Yeah, it, it does seem from what you're saying that employers are really missing an important segment of potential talent by not being more inclusive. Can you speak to this aspect? Yeah, and, and I think it's the misconception that accommodations are costly. You know, that's a, a, a huge, that is a very large misconception. And we know that the data is out there. The Job Accommodation Network out of the U.S. is leading the way when it comes to collecting true everyday data on employers and what the true cost of an accommodation looks like. Um, the recent survey out of about 4,000 employers at every size of um, of a business from small to large indicates that accommodations either cost nothing at all or that the average cost, one-time cost, is $500.
And I have a, a, a number of, a, a piece of data here that I really don't want to miss in how I'm going to pronounce it or say it. So if I can just read it to you, because I think it's important for everybody to make this point. You know, when we talk about accommodations, 85% of those businesses that were surveyed found that the workplace accommodations helped them keep an employee. So you were able to retain a valuable employee because you provided that accommodation. 85% of those businesses said so. The other piece is around 68% um, of surveyed businesses said that the accommodations were very effective in helping that employee do their job. So that goes back to that whole concept of performance and productivity. You were able to maintain or increase your performance and your productivity because you were provided with an accommodation. And the last piece that I want to give you is on the 40, on 46% of those businesses that were surveyed said that they were able to retain that employee they, because the accommodation was provided. So they, you know, it, sorry, it, pardon me, that 46% of businesses survey found that providing a workplace accommodation eliminated the cost of training a new employee. So it, it is a very efficient kind of, uh, you know, way of dealing with a major problem, which is employee retention. Um, employee retention. And, and, you know, and if I could just say that the cost of turnover is high. I don't know in the not-for-profit sector necessarily because I don't have those numbers, but in the for-profit, replacing a frontline worker will cost you around $4,000. And so that is um, uniform cost, the cost of the manager who's going to be training that person, the cost of all the associated other people that are helping onboard the person. That is time that is not really uh, associated with an HR process. It's what it is. You're welcoming a new team member. And when we're talking about managers, that cost can jump up to $15,000. So turnover is costly. Now, are there things that you see uh, employers doing without realizing it that prevent them from hiring people with disabilities? Very good question. And I think that sometimes what we find is the unintentional biases. It is the unconscious, unintentional biases that when accumulated among other members of that community within that organization can lead to unintended discrimination and providing, um, you know, not providing access to the opportunities that people could need in order to enter the workplace. So the first thing is to understand who is not within your organization. Who are we missing? So first of all, are we being intentional? in reaching out to the disability community and making it very intentional that we want to hire from them. The other thing is to review, how are you communicating that intentionality? Are your job postings accessible? Are they being provided in a number of ways, not just on Indeed, not just in a platform um, that is online? Because we know that online uh, websites or online uh, platforms can sometimes be not accessible. Um, providing an opportunity for that business, for that organization, for, a not, for that not-for-profit to be seen as wanting to reach out to the disability community, not as service providers, but rather as employers. Because I think that sometimes we conflict a little bit, those two. You know, we are providing services, but yet again, we are also employers. And so we should be looking at internally to see, are we reflecting the community that we are serving? And I think that's where that project search is kind of interesting, that program that I was speaking about earlier. Because the founder, who was a nurse at Cincinnati's Children's Hospital, was looking at all the people in the lobby that were being served, all these young people with developmental disabilities. But when she reflected on who was behind her as an employee, there was none of them. Nobody reflected the people that were being served. So I think that that's a really good way, at least for the not-for-profit sector, to do a check, to check in and see who is missing within your employee, employee um, 
base group and then start thinking, how do we intentionally reach that disability community, the disability community and say, we don't wanna just provide services, we want you to come and be part of our workforce as well. That's an extremely important point because we see a lot of discussion about in the diversity in other uh, ways and different identities, uh, for example, and dif different ethnic backgrounds. And um, that um, part of the argument is, is to be organizations that reflect the communities that they serve. And, um, you know, somehow or another, the, the people with disabilities have been kind of uh, left out of that discussion or that consideration. And, and yet they are a large part of the, the communities that are being served by non nonprofits in Canada. What are some of the first things that organizations should be thinking about if they want to become more inclusive and intentional in their recruitment process about inclusivity of uh, disabled people? Yeah, just as you were mentioned, just as you were finishing your last thought, I was thinking of another thought, and, and it segues really well here. You know, we have um, we have a, our own podcast that's called "You Can't Spell," you can spell inclusion without a D, and the D being the intentional D of disability. Uh, and so that intentionality that when you look at your initiatives for diversity and inclusion and equity and accessibility, that disability should be part of those conversations and intentionally welcoming people who have a disability to express their voices in terms of what is creating lack of accessibility including employment. Um, the other piece is that sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, people who have invisible disabilities tend not to disclose for fear of stigma. And so building the capacity internally to create a culture that can create safe spaces for people to intentionally start asking for the things that they need to succeed. When Odin trains businesses on disability awareness and confidence, the very first thing that we talk about is, you know, ask people not what is the accommodation that they require, but ask what do they need to succeed in their role. Because more often that is the accommodation. <laughs> if we're not talking about ramps, we're talking about flexibility and how the work gets done. Maybe flexibility on schedules. If you're a person who has an episodic disability and maybe mornings are difficult for you because of a medical condition, just maybe shifting your start date from a nine o'clock to a 10 o'clock could make a difference. And we know that you know, through the pandemic, we all had to be very flexible on how the work got done. So a lot of the times the disability communities is asking, maintain those flexibilities within the way that the business is op operates. Um, another piece could be that whole concept of building capacity. So provide everybody within your organization the opportunity for that professional development, for understanding what disability is and it is not. Um, you know, uh, lately Odin has been doing a lot of reflection, a lot of uh, finding resources that helps us build our capacity to understand the intersectionality of disability as well. That people bring with themselves not just the disability piece, but other intersectionalities. And, you know, culture, how in other cultures disabilities uh, understood is something that we are also now uh, uh, ourselves understanding. How do we help businesses navigate the concept of intersectionality and disability, race, um, religion, um, gender, all of this pieces that make up a person cannot be separated. And so I think that helping organizations to access that professional development that helps them understand the intersectionalities of disability um, and other identities, because that creates that whole, that begins to create the culture that welcomes everybody and the culture where conversations about what you need to succeed can also be um, fostered. 
Well, as you pointed out, uh, you know, talent management is is more than just recruitment. Um, and uh, thinking about, uh, I guess, uh, a commitment to um, intentionally including more disabled people in the potential recruitment strategy, but also, um, you know, what are should organizations be doing to ensure that they offer an inclusive environment that engages and, and retains uh, staff in the long term? So that whole concept of creating a culture that welcomes everybody and that provides opportunities for career development and for career growth, um, you know, establishing capacity for managers and supervisors to have an opportunity to discuss openly with others in a safe environment, how to work and accommodate um, people who they are uh, working with in regards to their accommodations or disability. You know, we often talk about accommodation and the budget for accommodation being a budget line not something that should just land on one specific department. And so we often say to um, organizations who are maybe putting forward a proposal for funding, include accommodations, include accessibility as a budget line. And because that now begins to demonstrate for the people within your organization, hey, they're being serious about accommodating my needs as an employee. You know, moving away from that concept that accommodation is a burden. Accommodation is what we are talking about for employees to succeed. I mean, if the numbers that I just gave you earlier on doesn't doesn't make a manager and a supervisor, you know, kind of uh, shock them into realizing that they are letting people walk away. You know, you're talking about talent growth and development. People are walking away because they cannot find an environment where their development is taken seriously because their accommodations are not being provided, the, the accommodations that they need to succeed are not being provided. So I think it's this shifting on how do we see disability and accommodation as a shifting from that concept of burden to one of talent that is bringing innovative perspective, problem solving solutions, um, uh, talent that is understanding, particularly if we are talking about the not-for-profit who serves uh, people who have a disability, to really have that insight internally to better serve, to uh, have a, a better understanding of the functional needs of the people that we are serving. Um, so I would say that I, I think that, that this, these are little nuggets of information that managers and supervisors can start thinking about. How do we create that culture where growth and development of people who may not be disclosing is, they see the potential because we're speaking out and we are intentional in the conversations of what we want people to have in order to succeed. Yeah, when you look at it a different way, uh, the cost of accommodation is really an investment. It's an investment in your talent and an investment in your operations that uh, and that could potentially keep um, valued employees much longer. So it's it's like any other sort of um, talent retention strategy. Uh, why not uh, think of it that way? Absolutely. So what what resources would you recommend for organizations um, who want to take uh, actionable steps to be more accessible and inclusive employers? So across Canada, there are a number of organizations. You know, uh, each province would have their own ODIN, so their own employment network. Uh, disability employment uh, network that can help them support them with uh, training and resources for uh, how to understand and how to better serve both people who have a disability who are consumers but also their own employees. Um, the Rick Hansen Foundation is another organization across Canada that can provide a number of resources. Um, the Canadian Association for Supported Employment is another organization that uh, Odin often partners with to support businesses and you know not-for-profits are 
employers and so they could find resources in there as well that will really fit well regardless of the sector that we're talking about um, in particular I am now thinking about the Canadian Association for Supported Employment runs a program called MentorAbility. It's a federally funded uh, program that allows or that um, provides a career exploration opportunity for somebody who has a disability. And often, I think that's another thing, you know, when we're talking about intentionality, you don't know what you don't know. If you're a person who has a disability and all you know is that a not-for-profit provides services, but you don't know that you could be employed by them, right? You don't see them as your employer. Maybe this is an opportunity to look at mentorship through programs like MentorAbility so that you can begin to cultivate a potential pipeline of employers for your organization who have a disability. So connecting with those organizations like CASE, that's the Canadian Association for Supported Employment with your local uh, disability employment network, and even connecting with uh, organizations like Rick Hansen Foundation um, that would provide supports around accessibility. You mentioned how we all had to become more flexible and how we looked at the workplace um, due to the pandemic. Do you think the rise in remote work has made a difference, positive or negative, to how people with disabilities are employed or their experience of employment? A number of people found that there was a benefit and that they were much more engaged in the workplace because that we moved to a remote work uh, and it provided an opportunity, a very large opportunity. The other thing was that we all noticed quite quickly how nimble we were. We were able to switch from going to the office to staying at home and working from home rather quickly. So I think the disability community also looks at that with, a, uh, with that whole hope that when we ask for change, when the disability community asks for changes, if we could change that quickly during the pandemic, that some changes could come quickly as well in order for their needs to be met. Um, other disabilities, other groups would have found going remotely a little bit more difficult. And I would say that those are groups for whom digital literacy was never something that they were provided access to. So whether it was groups like, you know, people who have developmental disabilities, um, people in the deaf community, um, if, if they were not provided with the literacy level that they needed in order to access digital, the digital age, the digital um, uh, tools that we were utilizing. I know that in the deaf community, that can be a, a very big barrier, you know, accessing digital interviews, so virtual interviews without an accommodation. Um, I was mentoring a young lady, an engineer uh, from Colombia, because I'm from El Salvador, so I speak Spanish, um, and she had requested to come up on a Zoom meeting or to request a, a virtual meeting, but she specifically asked for Zoom because she said the closed captions in Zoom are better. And so, you know, when we're um, when we are offering as employers opportunities for interview, you know, that would be one of those small little pieces of information that you want to make sure that you're asking people what do they need in order to be able to participate fully in that in, in that meeting. So I think to go back to your point, did it make it more beneficial? for the disability community to be remote, to work from home. For some people, yes. For others, it created a little bit more of a barrier. I think at the end, we need to be very mindful that it's about providing choice, about providing choices that meet the needs of the person, and not necessarily just go for one blanket of um, how things get done. And so again and again, the opportunity for alternatives of communication, how a job posting gets uh, put out to the disability community, you know, not just in the digital format, maybe we send it off to a particular employment agency and then they can distribute it to their community. Um, an employer uh, here in Ontario ended up doing videos in ASL, so American Sign Language, which is not a direct translation to English. They took their posting 
because they were intentional in accessing the deaf community and translated it into an ASL video. So if you were somebody who was deaf and did not necessarily read English, you can go into this video on YouTube and um, access the information through American Sign Language to know that they were hiring in this particular location. So again, is how do we provide information in different ways so that the person can then decide what is the best way for them? Odin recently released a report about the changes to employment services in Ontario and how they don't include people with disabilities. Can you tell us more about that report? Yes, in June of this year, we released the Tangle in Red Tape and that is a collaboration between Community Living Ontario as well as the Ontario Disability Employment Network. So we surveyed the agencies or the employment service providers in our uh, network. Community Living Ontario put the same survey to the agencies in their in their network, uh, and we compile and we. Uh, Compile. We we took all the responses and looked for uh, patterns, and we found that anecdotally we were hearing that there was a lot of barriers that are being um, that were being implemented uh, because of the transformation in the system, and that was corroborated by this by the data from the survey. You know, a lot more administrative work, a lot more administrative burden was being put, particularly on specialized employment service providers. Those are service providers that specifically we're supporting just job seekers who have a disability. And so the new transformation system opens up the opportunity for anyone to walk into an employment service provider and say that they want to be served. It doesn't necessarily have to be just one particular uh, agency. So because of that um, you know, opening up of opportunities, um, and because of the, the way that the system is currently set up um, with service system managers as intermediate, intermediate um, agencies between the funders and the agencies, that has created a lot more administrative burden. And that means a lot less time serving job seekers who need those supports in the workplace. Um, Odin and Community Living Ontario are providing a number of considerations and recommendations to the government to ensure that you know more engagement with this population, with this um, uh, specialist um, population is uh, provided so that we can then recommend, recommend some of the uh, answers uh, and some of the ways in which can they minimize uh, that burden. Uh, we have also highlighted a number of barriers, like the 20 hours uh, a week. Um, in order for you to be able to be served, you would have to have a job that is at least 20 hours a week. And for some people, that can be a barrier. Uh, if you're a person who has to um, build up your stamina to work to the 20 hours, that can be a barrier. So there are a number of barriers that have been built within the new transform transformative system that Odin is recommending for, um, for change. Excuse me, I had a, um, <clears throat> a frog in my throat, so I do apologize. Um, looking ahead, say five years, do you think that Canada will have made any strides in terms of providing more accessible employment? Are you feeling optimistic? And, and what needs to change to make that happen? I think we're making strides. Uh, I think that um, the progress is slow. Um, and I think that some of the... So, initiatives or policies like the Accessible uh, Canada Act is one. Um, you know, other provinces are looking at Ontario and, and looking at implementing their own AODA, their own accessibility for uh, um, for people who have a disability act and, and implementing policies within their own provinces so that they can better provide access to people with disabilities. But of course, I think that the progress is always a little bit slow. When it comes to what should be done, training, not necessarily training, but that whole concept of awareness. It is so interesting to me that in 2024, 
we still have to continue to create awareness of what disability is and is not. The fact that people with disabilities are a talent pool that is not being utilized uh, to the extent that it needs to. Um, we are still creating awareness that accessibility and accommodations are not difficult. Uh, it is all about having connection with people and treating people like humans. <laughs> For having that concept that, you know, what can we do to help you succeed? Because when employees succeed, organizations succeed, businesses succeed. When you are accessible to your consumers, when you hire, you can then understand how you can be uh, accessible to the consumers. You know, the data is out there. 78% of Canadians will choose to do businesses with a business that hires somebody who has a disability. As the parent to a child who has a disability, I go out of my way to find um, businesses that cater to families like myself. So I think that we are making progress. We're having more conversations um, at the federal level, at the federal uh, government uh, is um, investing heavily in uh, projects that do support the capacity of employers. Um, you know, we have National Disability Employment Awareness Month, which creates, uh, that is that campaign that creates awareness with the business community of the benefits of hiring more inclusively. We have in May the um, National, um, National Accessibility Week. So at the end of May, we have another campaign that brings awareness of the impact that uh, creating more accessible spaces and workplaces has in Canada. So I would say that we are making strides, but we still are doing a lot of conversations about awareness and education. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that as to, we hope that we move away from conversations into more action as my CEO likes to say some days. Well, Ingrid, thank you for your work to improve accessibility and employment opportunities, along with your invaluable advice to nonprofits and charities across Canada about how to break down barriers and make their workplaces and programs and communities more welcoming and accessible for people with disabilities. Thank you for joining Charity Village Connects. Mary, thank you for having us and for helping us spread the message that inclusive workplaces benefit everybody. <laughs>